here. I'm super excited to have this awesome group of alumni here to talk to us today or talk with us today. Um, I am, like Caitlin said, Jamaica. I'm the Director of Content and Community at Codesmith. And um, I would love for our panelists, if you all would go ahead and introduce yourselves. We'll start with your name, what cohort you were in, your most recent role, and how you ended up at Codesmith. So um, Brandy, if you could go first, that would be awesome. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Brandy Richardson. Um, I currently work as a software engineer at Microsoft. I graduated from cohort <laughs> LA40, and I ended up at Coldsmith because I was working for Delta Airlines in March of 2020, and then the pandemic happened. And at the time, I was like, oh, Delta is a great place to work until you're in a pandemic, <laughs> and all of our team was furloughed or laid off. And I've always wanted to transition into tech, but I think I was always like fearful and scared. Um, and so I just, yeah, I just started researching and um, I found Co-Smith through reaching out to people on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I went through Co-Smith program and it changed my life and it changed my pockets as well. And so, <laughs> yes, <laughs> excited to be here. Awesome, thank you. Um, Aaron, could you go next, please? Yeah, sure. Um, hey everyone, my name is Aaron Bart Addison. Um, I am part of. I was part of cohort New York Six. Um, I think I might be the only New York um, representative here, so represent for New York. Um, and I'm currently a web engineer too at Spotify. Um, I know Spotify has been in the news a lot recently. Um, and as far as how I got to Codesmith, um, so it's, it's kind of a funny story. So at the time, I was. Um, an instructional associate at um, General Assembly. Um, I actually went through the General Assembly boot camp before Coldsmith. Um, and as an IA, um, pretty much it was a TA. Um, like halfway through one of my cohorts, uh, one of my students was talking about going to like a Coldsmith meetup. And I'm like, what's Coldsmith? I thought it was like a game or something. Um, and he said, no, I, I learned about closures there. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm an IA. I know nothing. I'm like, what is a closure? So I figured I had to go, go, you know, learn what a closer is so I could teach these students properly. Um, and I ended up, you know, going through the program um, and graduating. And like Brandy said, it also changed my life as well. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Cam, if you could go next and then we'll finish up with Kyle. Yeah, I'm um, Cam. Um, I was in LA 38 uh, and I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, how I got into Codesmith, I was a senior at Howard University in the spring of 2020, uh, so I graduated into the pandemic uh, in accounting, and yeah, I kind of just like, during that semester, I just tried to figure out, like, I found out about Codesmith, I really liked it, um, I had an offer from PwC, and then I just kind of weighed that summer of what would be a bigger return on investment, like studying for the CPA or learning how to code. Uh, so I declined the offer and went to Codesmith. Awesome. More move. Right? And the rest is history. All right, Kyle, thanks. Um, yeah, Kyle Sherwood, um, LA Cohort 15. I had to just look that up. It's been so long. It's kind of crazy. Um, and I'm over at Adobe Systems right now. I'm a technical program manager there, and I really like it. So down to answer any questions you all have. Well, I have some questions, so we'll start with me and then uh, we'll let everybody else join in uh, in this party. So when we think about representation and how that can inspire our career trajectories, can you all point to any role models that you've seen in the tech space and how that might have inspired you as you thought about getting into tech? I'm going to throw it to Brandy first. Um, so for me, I don't know if I can point to specific role models. I would say my journey really kind of helped, but my journey started from me reaching out to different engineers on LinkedIn. Um, for me, there was a lot of fear, I, I will say, just because for a long time, the tech industry felt unreachable. Um, and even when you think about like growing up, software engineers and like tech jobs is not something that people really talk about in, in grade school. They talk about doctors and teachers and nurses and lawyers, but you rarely hear people talk about being a video game developer or growing up to be an app developer. And so I think for me, the tech industry felt really unreachable. Um, on top of that, 
I'm black and I'm a woman. And so I have like this double minority. Um, watch, well, I'm dealing with like a double minority, um, which I'm proud of, but I'm just saying it's, it's an issue like in tech, of course. And so I think uh, for me though, the, the biggest encouragement was just reaching out to other women on LinkedIn who were already software engineers. Um, and that's something that I would, really would encourage any and everybody to do is to build relationships with people on LinkedIn. Um, I used to go and add like engineers from Microsoft, from Google, from Twitter, or from Spotify. I would add them on LinkedIn and I would message them and write them and just ask them if they were willing to chat about their journey. Um, and for me personally, I mainly reach out to women or black people <laughs> just because I wanted to see representation. Um, and yeah, I, I would say people on LinkedIn for me was my biggest, uh, I guess my biggest motivating factor. Um, so LinkedIn is really powerful. It's a really powerful tool. So, fully agree. Um, Kyle, I see you're unmuted, so I'm going to go to you next. Oh, um, yeah. So that's a good question. I actually had to jump on LinkedIn myself and kind of look at a couple of people. Um, there's a guy, Brooks Scott. He actually is one of my mentors. Um, he kind of helped me when I was already in the field, but just to help me stay in the field and help me like sort of get over sort of some of the mental stuff and some of the like microaggression stuff that you kind of deal with. Um, strong black guy kind of working with a lot of different people who are working in tech. He has like a mentorship program. So highly recommend looking him up. I can give you guys his information. Um, and then I would say like my guy, Michael Rollins, um, he is the design lead at Walt Disney, um, specifically working on ESPN. And I think he works a lot on like their app um, for uh, fantasy. And he's uh, he's a really good guy. He went to my college. He was one of the first people to kind of help me get into tech when I was looking to um, more from like the UX perspective. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, those are two guys that I definitely looked up to uh, kind of going into things. Awesome. Uh, Aaron and then Cam. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm, my my story is kind of similar to Brandy as well, as far as, um, you know, role models. When when I was getting into tech, um, there weren't much, um, and you, we all know there isn't much representation of Black people in tech in general. Um, and as far as my circle, um, I usually just gravitated to, to you know, the, the Black folks that were like in my class, in my cohort, or those that, that had just recently graduated and now doing their thing. Um, so I kind of looked at as them as as more as like mentors and 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 inspiration for me. Um, if I if I had to say one person, um, there was this guy named Kareem Adams in my um, in my general assembly um, class, and he was he actually was already working in tech. Um, he had his own company um, doing IT stuff for like ten years or so, um, and he just wanted to get into coding to you know obviously you know boost his pockets, but also do something else as well. Um, and that was really inspiring for me. And I mean, the fact that he already had a, a whole company, um, literally was the head of it and is also in class um, in this boot camp with me. Um, so that was really in in inspiring for me. Um, and then if I had to name someone who was like, you know, outside of my circle that I don't really know personally, um, uh, I.G. Sandu, um, he's a Ghanaian American um, technologist, engineer, artist. He's he creator. He does a lot of things actually. Um, and he's pretty much like um, the closest representation I could say of me because I'm also um, Ghanaian American. Um, we both grew up in inner cities and he's doing some crazy, amazing things. So um, he's definitely an inspiration to me too. Cool, I could take it. Um, for me, it, it probably was mostly uh, my friends from college. Uh, I had a lot of friends who were computer science majors, um, who were also at, like out here in San Francisco with me at Salesforce and Tesla and all these other big tech companies. Um, and mostly it was like them throughout the entire process, just saying like, oh yeah, you totally can make it at one of these companies. Like it's, it's kind of like, there's like this false narrative that it's super crazy hard to get into, but if you just study, like anyone can honestly make it in. Um, so it was kind of like that and uh, their support was kind of like what made me kind of keep going uh, and know I, that I could make it. Wonderful, thank you all. Um, all right, so we were talking, Aaron was talking, especially like, you know, just reminding us all that there's just not a lot of representation of brown and black people in tech. 
I wonder, panelists, how do you feel tech companies in particular have evolved in their efforts to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and better support you know, marginalized, underrepresented communities? And where do you see opportunities for tech companies to continue progressing in their commitment to uh, DEI? So maybe Aaron, can you start with that? Yeah, sure. I can go first. Um, so for me, um, I think on, I guess, generally on, on a macro level. And what I mean by that is um, as far as like um, higher leadership C level, um, I think we we still need some more representation. Um, I know like in the, the last, I guess, like three or so years, uh, ever since this pandemic has started, uh, there was some like controversies and some um, unfortunate happenings um, that kind of like, you know, pushed and forced some tech companies to, you know, have to respond or, or say they're going to respond and do things. Um, and I know it takes it takes years for for monumental change to happen. Um, but I think at the at the end of the day, um, we still need a lot more representation at the high level because when, you know, decisions are being made at the end of the day, these people um, make those decisions and they have that power. Um, so if we're not in those seats and able to, you know, give the perspective um, from our end, then, you know, it's still going to take a long time to, to make that change. Um, as far as on, on a micro level, and and what I mean by that is more like the, you know, engineers, maybe more so closer to, to the people on this panel, um, I, I can see, you know, more of us here, um, for sure. Um, but um it's it's tough um still at the end of the day because um uh the numbers are still low compared to our peers um in these tech companies um and as far as opportunities for growth i i still feel like if we had more um you know targeted programs and funnels for you know like black engineers um to get into these to these uh companies um i think that would you know obviously help a lot more um, because at the end of the day, with the the, engine, the black engineers that are, are are at these companies right now, um, it's still kind of stressful for us to have to um, you know represent the black people in the company while also trying our best to you know get our people in the door as well um, when there's all these obstacles. Um, so um, even though you know some change has been made as far as um, you know getting more of us in here, um, I think it's still at the top. There's a lot more things that need to be done. Um, and some more targeted programs that can get us into the, the door faster. Kyle did, you, uh, Kyle, did you have anything to add there? I mean, I would definitely agree. Um, I've been in the industry for about five years now, and, which is kind of wild to think about. And I think in that time, DNI has kind of grown from a buzzword to more of something that people are taking seriously. And I think it's because of a lot of what happened in 2020. Like, people had to respond to that um, and companies didn't want to be on the wrong side of that. So it's unfortunate that that was really what caused things to change. But I think that's when I started seeing serious change. Um, I think it's also been interesting because I started out over at Google. And so seeing what things like what things were like there was very interesting and in seeing how it's different in Adobe. Um, personally, I feel more comfortable at Adobe. Um, and I don't think that it's... Uh, strange that we're rated like i guess the number two place for work uh for employees of color um by i don't know comparably.com um i i think actually that that means something at adobe at least we have a black employee network which is filled with a lot of my favorite people in the company they were some of my first friends here um and i think there's a lot of funding for that so we do things from like uh hosting panels uh with uh, therapists who talk about how to deal with microaggressions at work um, to, uh, you know, one of my favorite things was having this woman, Ruby Bridges, who you all may have heard of. Um, she was one of the first women to uh, join a segregated school in New Orleans. Um, and just hearing from her and her, you know, childhood and how, what that was like was super incredible. Um, so just having opportunities to hear from people like that is also really cool. Um, but I think in general, like, you know, um, like Aaron was saying, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Like those things are nice, but is it actually leading to real change? Um, I think at Adobe, like our tagline or big tagline is tagline is uh, Adobe for all. And I think that's important because a lot of what we do is aligned to that. 
and um, executives are forced to do things that align to sort of that that ethos. Um, and when executives are publicly speaking about injustice and publicly speaking about being more inclusive, I think that's where real change starts. Um, you know, we even talk about those things in uh, in our review meetings. You know, how comfortable are you? Like, you know, are you having issues with anybody? Things like that. Um, so I think you know they're actually taking it very seriously. Um, I also think it's important for folks to try to sit on interview panels. Um, I've been lucky to do that for a few folks. Um, and it's, you know, we gotta be in that room. So I think as you guys get into these roles, like just remember that this is also a little bit bigger than you, unfortunately, like you are kind of having to wear that, that hat um, of, the, of the black representative at your job. You know, I'm one of three in a department of 500 people. Um, so it's really important for me to be in those kind of hiring decision rooms. I'm not a recruiter, but I try to get into into that situation. So I would recommend that uh, folks do the same. I love that. Um, I love that recommendation. As somebody who came from a business background, MBA programs, you know, those types of hiring decisions as well. I just I think that's so important, and it's just totally true across industries. Um, but since we're talking about tech, it's very much true um, in the tech industry. So I, I love that um, suggestion. So Kyle, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you a little bit because I know you were talking that you were saying that you're part of the Black Employee Network at Adobe, and I know that all of you have graduated recently, um, in the last few years from CodeSmith's immersive program. But can you tell us a, a little bit more about any particular initiatives or work that you're involved with to help empower the community and increase uh, Black representation in the tech space? And since you started with it, Kyle, I'm gonna jump back to you for a minute. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so. Off the rip, I think that when you guys join these companies, like find your employee network. Um, it's it's super helpful uh, just to find that space that's for you um, and for people like you. You know, you're all dealing with similar problems. So I think the Black Employee Network is a big one for me. Um, I don't sit on leadership for that group at Adobe, um, but I'm close friends with all of the leaders, and I think you know I help there. Um, but I'm also part of uh, a group called the BDPA, the Black Data Processing Association. Um, very old group. They were founded in 1975, as the name kind of dictates, it's kind of archaic. Um, and I really like working with them. Um, their whole thing, like the whole reason they exist is to be a network of Black folks in tech and trying to build a pipeline for people from high school to college to get into tech roles. Um, Personally, I feel like there's a lot more work that they could be doing and they're always looking for new members. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely Google it. Um, I think right now what they really are looking for is anyone who's interested in branding and social media. Um, like I mentioned, they're kind of old and they need to kind of shift from uh, their old logo and just the way that they do things and the way that they market to younger people. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, I think that could be like a good volunteer opportunity for folks and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you so much. Brandy, do you, could you go next? Yes, yeah, sorry. Can you repeat the question? No problem. Um, so can you tell us about any particular initiatives or work that you're involved with that helps empower the community and increases Black representation in the tech space? Um, I would say at my job, we have um, an employee resource group as well. Uh, it's for Black engineers and Black people at Microsoft. Um, but even outside of Microsoft, I think the biggest way that I feel like I'm impacting people is just always uh, reaching, like whenever someone reach out to me on LinkedIn or Instagram, I'm quick to reply. Um, I also love to ensure that specifically Black people and women, um, in Black, Latin, Latinx and women um, are like, so whenever a woman, a Black person, or even a Latin, Latinx person reach out to me, I'm quick to reply because I think for me, it's important for us to be extremely prepared when we're interviewing. That way people are not looking at, at us as like a diversity hire. Because I, I know we're talking about like a lot about like diversity initiatives and um, just things that tech companies are doing. But a lot of times people can look at you as a diversity hire. Like, oh, like she didn't really put in the work or she didn't, um, I don't know. She's not like, she just was hired just to meet some sort of quota. And it's so interesting because a lot of times what you'll find, um, especially if you read different forums, that a lot of times people that are interviewing Black people or women, they tend to actually make the interview process even harder for us. 
Um, and so the whole notion that people are being hired for a simply for a diversity hire is just inaccurate because time and time again, um, you've seen and I've seen just like how the opposite is actually taking place. Like people make the interview process even harder for us. And so because of that, I think for me, one of the ways that I'm contributing is just making sure that women and black people are really prepared for their interviews, that we um, are great engineers, uh, you know, know how to solve technical problems and know how to negotiate our salaries as well, because a lot of times we don't negotiate. And so I think those are all the ways that I'm contributing. Um, it's not just at my job, it's even outside of my job. Awesome. Always negotiate, always. Everything is based off of that initial base salary that you come, you get when you get into your company, FYI. Okay, uh, Cam and then Aaron. Yeah, I feel like I follow like something similar to Brandy. I mean, we do have a, a black inclusion network at Google, um, but um, it's more of kind of like a spread out thing right now, kind of like within my organization at Firebase. Uh, and I love my organization, um, but as far as like our console team, I'm one of two black engineers. Um, so, and he's in Boston and I'm in SF. And then that's like, that's it as far as representation. Um, so it definitely, definitely could be better. Um, but yeah, I just try to be available on LinkedIn. Um, if people ask questions, I try to be as honest as I can with my response um, and give like actual good feedback and advice based on things. And if I don't have time, I'll like let them know, like, hey, I can't, like if someone wants me to review a resume, Sometimes I'll have to like let them know like, hey, I'll be back in like three weeks, but I'll always try to like at least let you know that I'm busy right now and I'll try my best to get back to it. Um, so I just try to be forward with my communication to people. Um, and yeah, I give mock interviews. Um, a lot of stuff with Howard I still do with a lot of uh, students who are studying for their interviews for software engineering internships. Um, so that's kind of how I try to stay involved. I love it. That's so important. Yeah, as far as me, um, I will say one thing. I am trying to be better with the LinkedIn thing. That's one thing I'm trying to do this year. Um, a lot of people reach out on LinkedIn and I want to like get back. Um, but I do want to be better with that. Um, but as far as the, the work that I'm doing, um, uh, besides Spotify, I'm actually also CTO of a nonprofit organization called Clear Path NYC. And um, our whole mission is tackling uh, homelessness in New York City for, uh, for the youth coming out of foster care. Um, and what, what we're doing is creating a portal of resources for, um, for this homeless, for homeless youth to, um, you know, get out of their situation, not only get out of their situation, but also empower themselves to, to um, you know, be successful um, in society. So uh, mainly, we have a bunch of academic programs, uh, professional service programs, um, shelters as well, and a directory. Uh, and we're continuing to build out direct, that directory um, to also include um, public bathrooms, hopefully soon as well, um, and provide you know as as much resources as possible um, for homeless youth. Um, if I want, if I could provide some numbers here, um, as far as like New York City is concerned. Um, I think the numbers are about like 60% uh, Black and Latino are homeless, are in homeless shelters. Um, so that's clearly way too much. Um, and that's something that needs to be addressed. And, and hopefully we can, you know, make an impact here and, 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 and move further than that. So, um, yeah, uh, I will probably plug in our Instagram um, in the chat somewhere if you guys want to follow. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Definitely let us know. And Caitlin's follow up, we'll we'll have a couple of these links. If if uh, panelists, if you have anything that you want to share out, let us know, and we'll make sure that everybody here gets it. Um, I have been tapped on the shoulder to remind me that we can't be here forever, so I'm going to speed up my stuff a little bit here. Um, so I'm sure a lot of the people who are on who are listening in are curious about what your job search looked like post graduation. So we'd love to hear about your personal experiences when about job searching navigating the interview process, determining company fit for you, those kinds of things. And I'm going to throw it to Brandy first and then Cam and Aaron and Kyle. I'm probably going to skip you all at this point just so that we have time um, to get to people's questions as well. So Brandy and then Cam, if y'all could answer that one for me. Job search post-graduation. 
Yes. So the first thing I'm going to drop this link in the chat for those who are searching for software engineer careers. Um, it's a site called levels.fyi. Um, and if you go there, you see like all of these different salaries for Microsoft, Google, Spotify, Twitter, Facebook, all these different salaries. So when I was doing my job uh, search, I would go there as my motivating factor to look at the salaries. Because the one thing I learned about tech is there are levels to six figures. Um, and so a lot of times when you come into tech, you're like, oh, okay, 100,000 is like my goal. And then you come into like working for a big tech giant and you're like, no, that is no money for a tech giant. Like most people are making high 100s, 200s, 300s, 400s. And I know that sounds unrealistic, but it's, it's the truth because your compensation is your base salary, your sign on bonus, your annual bonus, and then RSUs, which are restricted stock units. And so I say all that to say, it's important to have some sort of like, like, okay, what's motivating me? And not to say that money was the only thing that was motivating me, but it definitely helped when it came to my job search. And so um, one thing I would say, my job search for me, I was really big on LinkedIn. I would go and reach out to recruiters on LinkedIn. I would message them and uh, just ask if they could either put me in touch with another recruiter who was recruiting for the specific role. I would reach out to other engineers at that specific company um, that I was interviewing for just to see if they can give me like any type of advice or tips. Um, and then I would practice. I would do a lot of practicing. I would do a lot of leak code problems. I'm gonna post a leak code website in here as well. If you are looking to get on at like a huge tech giant, you need to, the reality is you have to be good at leak code problems. They're not the most fun. They're really hard at times and challenging, but it's really, really beneficial. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much how my journey went. Um, I sent a similar message to every single recruiter. I would change their name. Um, and I would also send messages out again to a lot of engineers. And I would kind of like uh, make the engineers feel really good. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love what you're doing at your company, even if I didn't know what they were actually doing. I would just say like, I love what you're doing. I would love to like, I don't know, I'm, I'm inspired by you and I wanna be where you are one day. You know, you have to make them feel really good. And nine times out of 10, if you do that to an engineer on LinkedIn, they're going to respond back to you because, you know, people like to get affirmation. Um, and so reaching out to engineers on LinkedIn, reaching out to recruiters and just constantly applying. And then another thing that I did, um, the I saved like the, the main like top companies that I wanted. I saved those towards the end. Like I, I interviewed those uh, towards the end. And so Spotify, Microsoft, and uh, Twitter were my top three companies. And so I interviewed at those companies towards the very end. And I ended up getting offers from all three. But um, yeah, it, it was just like, a for me, it was, I interviewed at other companies first and then went for those. Another thing I'm gonna say really quickly before I pass it to Cam, if you receive multiple offers, don't be afraid to negotiate and also make them compete. So. Twitter gave me an offer and I was like, okay, Twitter, that's good. But um, this is what Microsoft is offering me. And then I went back and told Microsoft, hey, this is what Twitter is offering me. And so I made them compete with one another. And so I would encourage you to do that as well. I think that's all the advice that I have for now. And how much of that did you learn from Codesmith? And how much of that did you learn? Did you just know or learn from your own experience over time? So I learned a lot from Cole Smith because Cole Smith prepared me when it came to like the interview process and doing like data structures and algos and building apps and things like that. Um, Cole Smith also was really huge when it came to my technical communication because that's one, one thing that you're going to learn throughout an, an engineering boot camp is technical communication. Like Cole Smith was always talking about that. And it's so crazy because even when I was um, interviewing for Microsoft, there was a problem that I couldn't necessarily solved all the way but because i had great technical communication they still passed me I, although the uh, the interviewer that was interviewing me he also couldn't solve the problem either so i think that's also why he passed me but the point is is that i had really good technical communication and i think Coastman for that and also just pair programming that's really important um and so yeah yeah. Awesome. Okay. And the pair programming for anybody who's not engaged with CodeSmith right now and some of our free programs, we have pair programming um, every week, totally free. You just show up and you can practice programming with another person who's around your level of coding. So really low stress, great opportunity to just practice code and technical communication, as Brandy said. 
Uh, Cam, could you go next, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so my hiring process, um, my process was during while I was working at um, Codesmith as a fellow. Um, so after I ended my fellowship is when I started at Google. But uh, during the fellowship, I, I actually wasn't, I, my goal was just to start working at a startup, honestly. Um, because I had just graduated from college, like I wanted just like some experience working somewhere and like working hard, that's like not an issue for me. If you know me, you know that like I usually am working um, probably harder than I should be. Um, and so I just kind of had like a process of getting my resume together. And then like, once that was good, all I did was practice on my narrative because I knew I have to get through the phone screen. Like there's no point in me practicing algos if I can't get past the recruiter. So I saw, I got really good at the phone screen to the point where like, I would have like minute markers where I knew like if a recruiter said these words, I'm good. Or if they didn't say these words at this point, probably not moving on. So I could start thinking about something else. Um, but I pretty much had my narrative down to a point where I knew immediately in the call, okay, this is good or this isn't. And then once I got through that point, then it was just, then I started working on algos. Um, since I was a fellow at Codesmith, I wasn't necessarily doing engineering at Codesmith, but um, so instead of like doing engineering, which you could do for one day, you could just have an extra hiring day. And so what I would do with that day is I would look at what our senior engineers at Codesmith, the pull request, like the code they were submitting and the code they were writing. And then I would try to figure it out. And if I had questions, I would go to office hours and like understand that. And then I would bring that into interviews when they asked like, what are you guys doing at your company? And then I'd be able to technically communicate like these big migrations or things we were doing at Codesmith. Um, and then that was sort of like how I talked about high level uh, things and trade-offs and understanding when you shouldn't, should and shouldn't use different technologies. Um, so my like strength definitely in the interview process was technical communication. I'm still not good at algos. I'm not like very good at all, honestly. Um, and my interviews at Google, um, they were front end interviews. So I had one data structures and algorithm interview and three front end uh, interviews, um, which are more just like vanilla JavaScript. But you have to have very good technical communication when you're talking about these things because you're not getting as much information um, as like you can ask a lot of clarifying questions when it comes to data structures and algorithms about like edge cases and things like that. But when you're talking about like the queue system or um, debounce and throttle and they just want you to talk about the difference of it and like priorities and things like that, um, you obviously just have to have good, good communication. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was kind of my process. Um, I didn't really use LinkedIn a lot. Again, my goal was to start working at a startup. So I applied at Y Combinators who's hiring every month. They dropped this like list of uh, companies who are hiring. And so I just applied to all of those every single month. Um, it'd be like a hundred. So I applied to like 250, I think total during my like January to March hiring, uh, phase. And, um, I also was just like, updating my LinkedIn, like when I started at uh, Codesmith and then like I got one AWS certification and then I got another one. Um, and then, then I started getting a lot of like inbounds from LinkedIn. And so I ended up interviewing at LinkedIn, Google uh, and Amazon and ended up signing with Google. Well, thank you. All right, yeah, so I, I know that people who are interested in software engineering are builders, they're problem solvers, they're people who want to create. And so I would love to know a bit more of what your day-to-day -day looks like now and anything that you're able to share with us about what you've been building or what you've been working on. And I'm going to open this up to everybody, even though I'm supposed to slow, like, I'll move, I'll move some other questions around, but I think this one's really interesting. So I'd love to hear what y'all are building. Yeah, I can, and, I can start off. Yeah, um, please. So, um, yeah, as far as my day to day, um, I work in the advertising BU at Spotify. Um, so I don't get to work on the, the, the mobile app or anything, but I work on Ad Studio, which is our advertising platform for users to create either advertisements for if you're, let's say you're an artist, you want to advertise your own music or for, you know, like concerts that they want to advertise and then put, be put on the free, pla free platform. Um, they can create it through Ad Studio. Um, and I work on the payments team for Advert for Ad Studio. Um, so as far as my day to day, um, I have standups at eleven o'clock. Um, if I have any other meetings before that, I'll have them. Um, 
and that's the main meeting I have for the for the rest of the, the or every day I should say. Um, my team also has a whiteboarding boarding session every two weeks on Monday, um, where we just go through um, just talking about ideas as far as how we can improve our services or um, if there is like a, a, a nagging bug that we should talk about or something for on call, we might do it there. Um, and then we go through the regular two week sprint cadence. Um, we have our retros at the end of the two weeks um, and we have sprint planning at the beginning of the sprints. Um, I'm also on the uh, Ask DOTSG, which is a text, which stands for text steering group. Um, so it's a group of engineers in the ad advertising um, domain um, that pretty much meet every two weeks and collaborate on how we can um, improve the ad studio um, tech ecosystem at large in general. Um, so we'll hold these meetings with um, engineers in the advertising BU and just um, go over initiatives and things like that as well. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, and as far as a product I'm working on right now, we actually, I actually just launched my first feature yesterday. Um, this is the first feature I've been working on since I got hired. Um, it's a billing center for Ad Studio. So before this, you couldn't, to only to view your bills, you had to directly reach out to like uh, one of the sales managers. Um, so now in our UI, we actually have a billing center where you can view the bills, bill details, you can download the bill. Um, and I worked on the, the UI for that and did some back end stuff for that too as well. So, um, yeah. Cool. You said you you did the you worked on the DUI. I worked on the UI UI. Sorry. UI. I, was, I thought uh, I heard DUI. I was like, mm, yeah. clarify. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks, uh, Kyle. Can you jump in here? Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so. Technical program management, um, it's definitely going to be probably a little different than what you guys are all looking to do. Um, I work with engineers, but I'm more on the operational side of things. So um, think of a program as a collection of many projects, uh, and they're typically things that are open-ended, so things that will continue to happen for a long period of time, if not forever. Um, so one of the teams that I support is dedicated to just Photoshop as a product. Um, and I should step back and say that I work on the adobe.com team. So uh, my team works on anything to do with like surfacing new content on the website. Um, and then the other team that I manage is dedicated to all of our video and other photography products. So I kind of sit at the center of a bunch of different teams, um, engineering, product management, product marketing, um, other BU units, um, and anyone who has questions about how things are going with a specific program that I'm running, um, they kind of come to me for that. And then uh, I host like, you know, weekly sessions uh, on updates and things like that, uh, report out on things and how things are going. So no two days are the same. Uh, I work a lot with a lot of people, which I think is very different than like an IC role in engineering, um, where you guys might not be working with so many folks. Um, and uh, yeah, it works well for me. Great, thank you. I see individual contributor. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then, and Brandon. Hello. Yep. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try and explain this in layman terms, because I know there's like software engineers in here, but also people that are not software engineers. And so I work on the industry cloud team at Microsoft. And so essentially what that is, is um, in society, we have different industries, right? We have retail, we have financial services, we have healthcare, sustainability, all these different industries. And so my team, we build out specific Microsoft products for each specific industry. And then technical sellers at Microsoft will come and take our products that we build and they'll sell those to that specific industry. So for instance, for retail, for a Chipotle store, we built out a app using um, Microsoft Canvas app. And it basically showed the way that um, servers and waiters and like workers at, at Chipotle, the way that they could um, basic, basic, basically like package up customers' food. And so it will show them like, how many ingredients is needed for a rice bowl or how many ingredients is needed for a bur burrito. And so we built that product out and then our sellers come and sell that for, they'll sell that to like the specific company in the retail industry. And then we'll do the same for like healthcare industry. And so we may build out like a patient portal, patient portal app 
and technical sellers will come and say like, hey, Emory Hospital, I'm, I live in Atlanta, so Emory Hospital is a really popular hospital in Atlanta. They'll say like, hey, Emory Hospital, Microsoft has this new patient portal. Well, they'll have, they'll, Microsoft has this new product that, um, you know, you can use for patients when, you know, patients are checking in or, uh, you know, I don't know if they need like any type of procedures. And so that's what my team does. We work with apps. We work with artificial intelligence because um, we utilize chatbots. And we work with Power BI dashboards, just different types of technologies. I don't want to like nerd out. Um, but essentially, <laughs> I build out different Microsoft products for specific industries and society. And technical sellers come and use those products for retail. So, you know, they may use it for Chipotle or Macy's. They'll use it for healthcare, for different hospitals. Um, they'll use it for like FSI, so for different banks. So that's what I do. It's a lot of like UI UX work as well right now. And uh, that's kind of where my passion is because I'm really big on keeping humans at the center of technology. And um, yeah, that's not as detailed, but I want to use layman terms because I don't want people to be confused. No, that's good. That's <laughs> good. Um, I love that too, about keeping people at the center of technology. That's, I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Um, all right, Cam, can we get a quick overview of what you either do or are building? And then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Yeah, um, so I'm a front-end engineer at uh, Google for Firebase. Um, Firebase is essentially a developer tool that powers mobile and web applications. Um, it's, it's definitely not like a thing that most people will know about because um, it's more, again, it's for developer tools. So like the customers for us are other developers. Um, so it's pretty like technical work, but um, it is nice because our customers are developers. The feedback is always like really, really great. Um, and we're able to iterate on that pretty quickly. So I love like still being able to work with direct, uh, developers and being on GitHub and stuff like that. Um, but as far as like my my day to day, um, the front end UX team for Firebase is in New York. Um, so I work a East Coast schedule. So I work like six to two. And then um, I like to run, uh, run marathons, training for one in April. So after that, I'll usually run at two. And then I have a friend, Rom team, who is in Codesmith. I was his fellow, actually. Um, but we created an NFT DAO um, on Ethereum. So we have a couple of releases a month where we just release NFTs. So it's been fun writing Solidity and working like Ethereum blockchain and like just working with other networks and different protocols. Um, but yeah, not to like nerd out too much, but that stuff is super exciting for me. Um, and then I also produce music and make beats for my friends. Um, so those are kind of like the day to day, my day to day life. Um, so I definitely take advantage of working the East Coast schedule um, so I can do all the other things I want to do. Love it. The flexibility that you have when you're able to really direct what you do in your in your life or for your work. It just gives you so much more opportunity to create the life that you want that's awesome yeah and there's uh, also just like a lot of a lot of time i would say like i have three meetings a week that are 30 minutes each um, <laughs> anything else we just talk over chat i don't really have meetings so you know you can just kind of do whatever you want during the day as long as your work gets done it's fine no one's gonna like try to figure out where you are because we don't really have meetings as engineers that's incredible as a director of content and community i have a lot of meetings <laughs> um uh but that's okay um, all right, so I do want to open it for Q&A. We have a couple of more questions for our panelists, so I will hold them if we don't see anybody with any questions. But if you have a question, please go ahead and use the raise hand function, which, um, yeah, so I see a few. So I'll just get started. I saw E first. So y'all, we in order to get as many questions as possible, please kind of keep your questions kind of short and succinct and try not to do too many follow-on questions. I'm sure that the panelists will be open to some offline conversation, some, I'm not gonna put that on y'all, I know you're busy. Um, but if we could keep the questions kind of short and sweet and then do our best to hold off on too many follow-up questions, please, thank you. E, I will let you go. Please unmute and uh, ask away. Yep, uh, hopefully y'all can hear me okay. My question is for Kyle. Um, it doesn't sound like from the description of your role that you do much coding. So, and if that's the case, I just am curious to know, do you have any concerns about maybe your skills atrophying or, and if so, how do you deal with that? 
That's, That's a I'm really good question, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely have not written a full stack application pretty much since I left CodeSmith. Um, I, I definitely have to understand code and I, I read a lot of code lately. Um, you know, I work with, again, the adobe.com team. So usually what engineers are working on are features for our backend system. We have a proprietary backend system that we also sell um, publicly, but a proprietary version of it. Um, so, you know, how that works and being able to have those conversations is something that I need to be able to do. Um, but in terms of writing code, I don't do much. Um, and how do I deal with that? I think uh, I like to encourage a lot of people to get into it because it's a lot more difficult than, oh, it seems a lot more difficult than it is, um, as you all well know. Um, you know, it's a lot of hard work to learn, but once you kind of get it, you can really get into it. So I think for me, the learning continues with just helping my friends um, who are trying to get into the space. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, E. Brent, uh, you're next. All right. First of all, um, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. Uh, my question is also for Kyle. Um, what made you want to switch uh, careers or change your, your career from a software engineer to um, the career you have now? I'm going to keep it a buck, dude. Like, I, I was a decent engineer, but I wasn't great. And I was... Uh, I, I felt like it just really wasn't something I was super, super interested in. Um, I like being close to technology and I'm very glad that I'm in this kind of career, but I'm definitely a more people focused person. Um, so for me, it was about finding that balance. Like how can I still be close to code and still be, you know, touching it without having it be my full end, like full stop of my job. Um, and I think that technical program management is like a really solid way to mix the two. Um, other than that, I think the other thing that I would probably want to be at some point is an engineering manager, but I'd have to be an engineer first in order to do that. So there's still time, might, might still switch back to an engineering role, but for now, this is what works for me. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark and then Eric and then Terry. Sure, this is, this is for any, anyone on the panel or anyone in the room really. Um, I'm just getting started with coding. Uh, before this, I was a musician and like a promoter, concert booker. Um, and I was, I was, I've always been mindful of like giving black and brown artists a platform for their art, for their music at different, different concert venues. Um, so coming into this industry, like everyone here is like, oh great, another white guy. Um, I just want to be mindful of what I could be doing or not doing, um, to, to just be an ally. So just curious if you guys have any insight on stuff to keep in mind as I get started in this industry. Well, I'll go, uh, was that Mark that asked that question? Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, Mark, for even being here. I think that's a, a first step is like being able to take a step back and like listen to what um, other black engineers have to say and just listen into our hearts. Um, I would say the biggest way to be an ally though, in my opinion is to not be afraid to do your own research. Cause I do think sometimes within like the whole tech space and like everybody's talking about diversity there's so much pressure on black people to educate um, about our history to educate about racism and to educate about all these different topics. and. The reality is, is that there's so many resources out there. And so it's like, you know, if people really want to like learn and grow, um, then don't be afraid to like, you know, take upon take it upon yourself to like educate your own self. Another way, a big way um, is not being afraid to like speak up if you see microaggressions or if you see racism. Um, I'll never forget when I was at Cole Smith, there was another uh, guy in my production team named Harlan. He was a white guy in another guy did something that was like, uh, and Harlan spoke up in front of our entire, entire cohort, like as a white male. And it's one thing for me to speak up as a black woman, but when another white male speaks up and checks his fellow white male brother on something, I think the impact is very different. And so um, I really, to this day, I appreciate Harlan for, for doing that because, uh, yeah, I just think like as a white male, like you have to recognize your privilege and your power. And so, 
when you're not afraid to speak up and correct, like, you know, other white people or specifically white males when they, when they do something that's like, uh, wait a minute. Like, I think that that really says a lot. Um, and also thank you just for asking that question. Yeah, thanks for answering it. <laughs> All right, let's go to, like I said, Eric and then Terry. My question is, um, as, as a recent college grad, something that came up in some of the talks that I got to sit in, there was this guy, I, anyways, I forgot his name, but there's this low code, no code movement. And it's something that I'm, I'm kind of uh, hearing more about. And so I'm asking a lot of some of the engineers that I get to meet people that are software developers and they go, oh, I don't even code anymore. Yeah, I just, I Google something, I copy and paste this and that, and then boom. And, you know, that's how they, that's, that's how they do their bread and butter. So uh, my question is, um, as, as folks that code or, or are developing programs, how much of that is true? And how do you feel or what do you think about this low code, no code movement? Um, I'm not like, I don't think I'm like familiar with, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Um, so, uh, uh, but I don't know. I, I feel like I definitely write a lot of code, uh, whether that's in JavaScript or Solidity or Java or Python, uh, I feel like I don't know. I'm very curious though. Like if I don't know how something works, I need to know like how it like, I'm not just going to like copy it and not know what like, there's like a variable in there, like a function that I've never seen before. I'm not just going to be like, okay, well, this is just like how it's going to work. Um, I need to know how it like works under the hood, which is what you kind of learn at Codesmith. Um, and so I think that is like, once you reach a certain level of knowledge, you can kind of just do that because you understand how things work and how patterns work and you kind of just like it gets cyclical like oh they're just doing this it may be a little bit different but it's the same pattern uh so you're kind of just like copying that over so that might be a thing um but yeah i mean at the end of the day you if you want to be a good developer you need to understand like how things work and not just making things that work you're not really going to grow that way i love it do the hard work Right. Get to get to that under the hood understanding. Make sure you can do the hard work. I love it. Um, all right. It's 929 on the East Coast. Um, panelists, can you stay on for a few more minutes? Are you cool with that to answer a few of these last questions? Cool. OK, thanks. Um, Eric, hope that answered your question or you feel good about that. Terry and then Glenn and then Marce. Oh, goodness. And then y'all just added some more. So um, get these questions in because we're going to wrap up in just a little bit. So, Terry, go ahead and you can go go right now. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamaica. And really quick, again, thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, any of you can pick this one up. So if you feel compelled, you have an answer, jump and dive right in. Take one or more than one. Uh, I'm a newer graduate and been working at my company now for three uh, months, uh, NPR, National Public Radio. And I am almost about 90% sure that one of the things that got me in there is the fact that I was one of those African-American hires. Uh, the entire company is very transparent that they are very focused on hiring women and also minorities. And what I would like, because it's, it's a it's a quote I heard, I don't know how the quote goes, but essentially it says, if you find that you're the only uh, one of a race or a gender in a room, then you're actually in the right room. And so what advice would you give to me or others that may be uh, that lone person in the right room? How do we maximize it? How do we ensure that number one, we represent, um, cause it's unfortunate, but sometimes we're representing our entire group <laughs> when we do that. Um, what are some of the best strategies or just a quick advice? What can I do to maximize that? And if others also find themselves in a very similar situation? I'd like to answer that one. Um, I would first say, man, um, I, I guess I wonder why you feel like you were definitely hired as like a person of color. Um, I think it's important for companies to have those initiatives, but you obviously have the skills. So like definitely remember that um, they hired you for that reason. Um, I think it's a bonus that, you know, you might add to a quota or whatever. Um, I think also, too, 
Um, one really good way to handle this is uh, bringing your whole self to work. And I know that sounds really cliche, but a lot of us don't talk the same way when we're at work. A lot of us don't dress the same way when we're at work. And I think that brings a lot of added stress to your day. Um, and I think, you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, talk to someone who maybe is in HR or talk to someone who is uh, in the, the Black Employee Network at your job or uh, a Black leader if they exist um, and talk about these kinds of things. And I think the more that you can bring yourself to work, the more people will get used to having Black people in their space, having people uh, of a different culture than them in their space. And they need to, right? Like, that's why they hired you. Um, so I would say try not to change yourself too much and try to bring your whole self to work if you can. That's a great advice. Thanks, Kyle. I'm trying to find myself to unmute me. Um, thank you, Terry, for your question. Uh, Glenn and then Marcel. All right. How you doing, guys? I just wanted to uh say first I appreciate y'all doing things for like that are bigger than yourselves, like, you know, Aaron with the, the homeless movement and, uh, you know, Kyle just getting on, you know, the panel to try to uh, help other black and brown people get in, you know, feel more comfortable at the workplace and just representing us well. I really appreciate that. Um, the question I really had was for Brandy. It was regarding uh, technical language. Like how, how would I go about uh, improving you know, my technical language, like I because I follow like Cole Smith on YouTube. I get a lot of good stuff. That's what that's actually why I'm here now. But uh, I just want to know, like, is there any particular type of um, uh, links you guys have or anything I could use to kind of, you know, improve my technical language? Because I know that's like pretty good for interviews. I think that's really important because I, I heard a lot of people say that they didn't know the stuff and you said it too. They didn't know the stuff, but because they kind of, they knew what they were talking about, you know, it, it made it a lot easier for them as far as the interview goes. Yeah, somebody just posted it, uh, Cole Smith workshops. And then Cole Smith also has pair programming sessions. Um, if someone from Cole Smith wants to drop the link, I don't have it. <laughs> but uh, that was a, how a lot of us improved our technical communication was through attending Cole Smith pair programming session. And so a pair programming session is essentially when two software engineers work on the same problem together. And so we'll like share a co-editor or a co yeah, a co-editor together. And one person is um, like writing out the problem, not writing it out, but typing out the problem, coding the problem. And then the other person is talking through it. Um, and so you keep doing that and, you know, you challenge one another, you ask questions but that is honestly the biggest way to improve your technical communication. You have to pair program with someone. Um, a second way to do it is also uh, to record yourself. That's something that I would do as well. So when, as I was like solving an algorithm, I would talk out loud and I would record myself and I'll go back and listen to the recording to see how, you know, um, yeah, just to see how my technical communication was. The biggest thing is to keep talking as well. Even when you hit those technical blocks, um, which is, can be really challenging because you're trying to think through a problem. So you have to think and talk, but uh, it really helps when you are able to articulate wh like what your thought process is. And so the biggest way, record yourself in Cole Smith pair programming sessions. That's really helpful. Thank you. Can I add on to that? Real yes, quick? please. Um, yeah, I will reiterate like pair programming and just, just talking with someone else who um, even if they're not as, you know, knowledgeable what they're what what you're doing, at least giving you feedback on on you know how your delivery is as well. Um, but on a more like particular note, like when you're going through, you know, like your resources or learning like the tech that you're doing, um, and listening to like other people who are knowledgeable on what they're doing, like if you don't understand the words or phrases, make sure you look them up. Uh, make sure you also look up, you know. Because in tech, you'll find that a lot of words and phrases and patterns are very similar. Like they might just have different different names for it. It might mean just mean it might just mean something different, different language. But they're very similar. If you're able to break down what that big large concept is to you know you know in layman's terms, like like Brandy was saying, it'll make it much easier for you. It'll make it much easier for you when you're learning a different language as well. 
Um, because you figure out like, oh, this is just the same concept in, in Python. Like Lambda is just, you know, like error function and JavaScript or whatever. Um, so just trying to just break it down to, you know, the easiest, you know, concept for you. Um, and then from there, you'll be able to um, to get better at, at, at using and more comfortable using the terms. Great advice, both of you. Thank you. I think one of the things that I just heard from Aaron was, you know, be curious. Don't let it just be like, oh, I don't know what that is and kind of let that fly. Just be like, OK, so now I need to know what that is. And I don't know what this one is, so I need to know what that is. Right. And so really be curious and make sure that you're consistently asking that question. Be a toddler. I have a four year old. Be a toddler. Why? 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 What is this? Why? And really, really get to that that answer so that you can really understand it and know it. The other thing that I would say is if you're not part of our CSX um, Slack community, you should be. Um, we have over 10,000 people who are part of that community. There are folks who will just show up in CSX and say, hey, I'm, I'm a free for pair programming from this time to this time. Anybody want to work together? So there's our workshops, there's our events, but you can also just do it one off with people in the community. And it's a great opportunity for you, for anybody to meet some new people, to get to build out your community, but also to practice. Um, so I would highly recommend that without, without being salesy. Um, it's totally free. So just come and come and join and be part of it. All right. I would like to just like oh, quick, quickly please. add on to that. I think that's kind of like a good mindset to have throughout, like basically forever. I think that was like very addicting for me. Like when I went when first, like, oh, I don't know what this is. Let me look it up. And then like you do it and then you like you start solving things and then you start solving bigger problems. And then like it's just like a cascading effect. So like. You know, you're you're at this stage now, but then you hit Codesmith, and then like things are a little bit harder, and you're not knowing what's going on, so you're looking those up, and then you get your first job, and now you're at like an even bigger code base, and you're like, I I still don't know what's going on, so then you're like looking those things up, and like maybe you do like side projects, and you want to learn like how Ethereum or Bitcoin works, so you just keep those skills that you've just built over the time, and it's like you can really learn anything. I think that's like the most beautiful part about like starting this process is. It gives you the power to feel like you really can learn anything and you can because like you're breaking steps down and you're just like okay let me figure this out cool got it now i have this new thing but i'm one step further than i was 10 15 minutes ago and it's like it's like a a boost like it's just very exciting to be like okay cool i'm at the next era even if you are ten thousand steps away you're one step further than you were yesterday and you couldn't even you had no idea how it worked yesterday and now you're one step further so like it's just like kind of addicting and then before you know it you're doing these crazy uh things that you never thought you'd be able to do but you i think everyone in this room like definitely bet on yourself you 100 percent can do it um just like literally taking it as like trying to accumulate daily wins and you know a year two three four years you'll be amazed where you end up being honestly wonderful thank you cam um marcel then drew then danny then prince and then we're gonna stop with questions and finish up. Uh, thank you, Cam, for what you just said. I'm going to be a fellow, and I wanted to just find out from Cam what exactly, or sorry, what are the tricks and what part did you take to get the fullest like experience from that experience itself um, to make it to where you are today? Um, thank you for sharing everything you did. Like, If that is a bit too much, we could also just like speak in private if that's fine with you guys. And yeah, I'm shout out. I'm coming here from the NY30, and I'm pretty sure that I can relay this information to the rest of my cohort because I'm not sure I don't see any of them here. And this would be like a very, very big help um, to the rest of my cohort mates and the juniors as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can talk about my like my fellowship experience. Um, I was actually hey, Brandy's. Can you? Yeah. Um explain for those who are not part of the Codesmith oh, community yeah. yet what a fellow actually is. Yeah, so when you go through Codesmith, um, you have your instructors um, and then you have the residents. And then you also have these uh, employees at Codesmith that are called fellows. And essentially they're just like TAs. They're basically grad assistants, people who've graduated from the uh, residency and now they're just here for three or six, uh, six more months to Kind of like help facilitate the program and help out wherever they can um and it's great because these people have just went through what the residents are going through so it's very easy for them to relate to the problems 
the residents are going through that sometimes the instructors may not because they've been there two or you know three years removed and they're a little bit more high level um and so like the fellows are really the ones on the day-to-day -day. if a, if a resident doesn't know how to do something the fellow is usually the person helping not the main instructor um and so you do kind of and you also mentor um a production project group in great resumes um or and you give resume advice and you, you do grading and stuff like that so um it's a great experience um honestly i, I definitely learned a lot from there um, but as far as like me personally trying to maximize that experience, um, I tried to maximize the technical communication aspect of it most. So I really looked forward to having one-on-ones with students who didn't do well on like, maybe like we have an assessment um, and there's no like pass fail at, at Codesmith. It's just like, if you don't do well, we'll just have someone, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one with you and kind of like talk through and see like what went wrong. Um, and if you did do well, then obviously you're just moving on to the to the next um, module. But I really looked forward to those one on one meetings because that was a chance for me to see like how good my technical communication was, because if this person didn't know what was going on and they can leave this meeting having a good understanding, like a base knowledge of like what they did wrong and how they can fix it in the future, then I'm like, OK, cool. That was a good, good experience. Um, they're on they're on track like. I'm glad I had that experience with that person. If it didn't go well, I would try to make sure we had at least another one to make sure that like, hey, don't even worry about like trying to finish the module. Like we need to like, you just need to understand these base concepts and everything else will fill in, you know, towards the end of the road. So I think just really focusing on, and when you're giving approach lectures as well, like you're teaching to like the weakest person in the room. You're not, you're not there for the people who already know how it works. Like that doesn't really benefit most people um and don't be afraid when you are a fellow to call those people out and, and like or if they ask questions that are clearly technically way too strong for the class don't be afraid to ignore those questions and make sure you're just like teaching to everyone there so everyone in the room has a base understanding of what's going on and feels confident moving on to the next stage not just like the top five people that would be my advice um, Drew, can you go next, please? And then Danny and then Prince, and then we're going to finish up. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to know, uh, so what degree can you guys like attribute your development as an engineer to on-job training and resources uh, to versus like launching your and shipping your own side projects? Like, especially if you're looking to get into um, something that may be required like a little bit beyond like your job description so if you're looking to you know branch into like blockchain in the crypto space you know, a, you know after your first year role like what what resources do you think were provided by like a company versus you know you guys going out and finding people and finding resources yourself I feel like I want to leave this one for the engineers, um, but generally, I think a lot of my learning in my role and technically working with engineers has come from the job. Um, Cam made a really good point where, like, you know, I think a lot of us joined this general career path because we are interested in learning how things work. Um, so that never kind of sleeps and I never really turn that off personally. Um, so if it's not something at work, um, it may not necessarily be a side project, but it could be like looking into how, um, another product works, um, generally just because I'm interested. So I think that's a good way. Um, I, I can jump in here as well. Um, so I mentioned, I think you mentioned like, um, doing like side products versus, um, you know, work at. The, the work you get at, at your job um, and trying to transition, if I'm getting it correct. Um, I, I remember my my first role after Coldsmith, um, I was at a health tech company. Um, <clears throat> and when after like a year in um, and I was trying to, I guess, um, also looking for other jobs, um, I found it kind of hard to do side projects because at that point I had, you know, um, pretty much gotten more things to do at work and, you know, was also looking to be a senior a, 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 as well. Um, so I think my advice here would be, um, depending on where you're at in your career, um, I'd say if you're, if you're like you're a year in or if you're like trying to aspire to be like a senior, um, it might be easier for you to try to find more things to do like at your job to, to get to that role than like taking on side projects. 
um or if if possible if you want to transition to like something else if you can find that at your place it might be easier to do that first and then maybe get that and then transition out to a different company um just so that you're not you know doing too many things at one time um because i i found it hard to do side projects while i was you know um at work trying to be a senior engineer as well um so that would be my advice there I, i'd say um to just try to focus on you know what, what what's the priority are you doing the side project um because you know this is going to be like your passion this is something you're going to transition into like eventually um then maybe like you know maybe put some more focus there uh but if you're you know just trying to be better like in your role or um like i said if you're trying to transition into something else if you can find it at your job like um and transition to that role there i think it'd be easier to do to do that yeah, yeah, and for oh. and for me, um, I think it was just it definitely is like a passion of mine or something I just didn't understand and I wanted to work on. So that's kind of like why I made like the crypto stuff my my secondary. I was just again, it was that like, oh, I don't know how this works, uh, type of thing. And I just wanted to learn about it. Um, and then also I'm the other person who works on it, the other dev uh on our website is uh he works at a startup. And so we bring like different uh, like thought processes together. So it makes it really fun because he's working in an environment where it's really fast um, and he's putting out products like all the time. And I don't get that experience at Google. Like my, my process is very, very long to release a feature, but I can bring that to him to like give some structure of like, these are the things we need to make sure we have before we release this, this feature because he doesn't get that experience. He's trying to push stuff out. I'm not really, I don't really get to code like a ton like I would like to do because we have a lot of procedure here, but it makes sense because like those are the things you do need to have a successful product that you want to scale, um, which is something that we are definitely trying to build for. So it's fun to be able to kind of like use what I've learned at work and then also get to build fast and then, but also learn from him on like how you develop features quickly and like things you can do and stuff like that. So it's fun just to be able to use the skills I'm not using at work on my side project and then, but also leverage what I do do at work um, on the project as well. Great. Thank you all. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Danny and then Prince. Hey, so my question is essentially for anyone I know Brady, I think is mid-level at Microsoft and Aaron just mentioned he's a senior. Were there any questions um, while you were in your job search that were kind of like, where they questioned the level that you were applying for? And if so, how did you deal with it? Um, so I got bumped up a level because of my interview. I had a uh, system design interviews on my uh, during my interview process. And normally you get system design interviews for like senior roles. And so when they gave me a system design, I asked my recruiter, um, hey, y'all gave me a system design. I guess that means y'all trying to bump me up. I didn't say it like that. But uh, yeah, I actually reached out to my recruiter about that because normally you don't get system design interviews for like entry level roles. Um, and that's one thing I will encourage people like for me, I, I kind of regret that I even thought that I could only get entry level roles because yeah, my position right now is mid-level. It's a level two, um, well, it's a, it's a level 61. So it's like 61 and 62 at Microsoft is mid-level and then 59 and 60 is entry level. And so, uh, yeah, I just did really good on my interviews. And so they bumped me up. And um, I, I think, I, again, I just wanna encourage people uh, don't be afraid to go for the mid-level roles or the senior roles, um, because a lot of times with tech, they don't just base it off of your experience. A lot of times they also base it off of how well you do during your interview, because I had zero years of experience. Well, I count my experience at CodeSmith, so that's one year. But besides that, um, again, I transitioned from recruiting. So um, yeah, I asked my recruiter to bump me up because they, they gave me a hard senior level problem hello, you need to give me some senior level money. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I just asked to get bumped up, actually. Thank you. And good for you. Nice work. <laughs> Advocating for yourself. Um, all right, Prince. 
Um, hey everyone, hey, nice to meet y'all finally. Um, I'm gonna make this really quick because it's been ripping all the time. Uh, my question is for Brandy, especially. Um, so Brandy, you were saying that in the interview, it's very important that you keep talking during the interview. Um, but I found that like sometimes when I'm in an interview, it, it kind of helps if I take like two or three minutes to think about a problem before I start talking. Is that something that you would not recommend during the interview or like you would want me to modify that in some kind of way? I, I think it depends on what stage, like if you're talking about like phone interviews or like solving al um, algorithms and data structures. Yeah, like solving algorithms and data structures. Um, okay, you said that I said to keep talking. Yeah, so I guess I meant more so like when you hit technical blocks is to like communicate your technical uh, thought process. Um, and so like that. just communicate to the interviewer, like what you're thinking, what blocks you're hitting, um, cause sometimes the interviewer will even give you tips as well. Um, yeah. and so, but again, I, Prince and me, I, I know Prince, we had this conversation. That's <laughs> why you should have came to Coldsmith cause they teach you this at Coldsmith. <laughs> no offense to your boot camp, but, um, uh, yeah. So I, I would say, I guess I meant more so like when you're hitting those technical, um, like blocks, you want to communicate what's happening. You want to communicate your thought process. You want to communicate you know, which way you're thinking about going uh, in regards to like solving the problem. So, I mean, I don't think it's it's bad to like take a minute to like pause or breathe, but I'm, I'm more so just meant like to keep talking. Like like if, it's, if there's too many moments of silence, you know, it can get a little weird. So you just want to communicate to the interviewer um, what you're thinking. Again, I come from a I come from a business background. That's the same advice that we would give anybody going through like um, consulting interviews. So if you're going to for McKinsey, Deloitte, whatever, Accenture, similar thought process as you're going through those kind of consulting interviews. But it's so makes sense. I totally agree with it. She would know better than me for this. I just it, it reminded me of my previous world. Um, thank you. Thank you all panelists for that. Um, I have um, a quick announcement and then I'm going to close us out with a final question to all the panelists. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we're so glad that you were able to make it. Panelists, thank you so much for all your insights. This has been awesome. I just loved hearing about you all, your experiences, um, and what in your advice. I mean, it's been awesome. So thank you so much. Um, so Codesmith has had in the past uh, the Black Engineers Scholarship, and we haven't had it for a little while. And so, you know, there's been a lot of conversation behind the scenes. We've been doing some, like, looking at the books, whatever. But um, I want, I'm very happy to say that we are once again offering 100% um, full tuition scholarships for the Codesmith Immersive Program for Black engineers. So this is another fabulous opportunity for y'all to be like our panelists and change your life, um, just the trajectory of your life and potentially to do it without having to take out loans or pay for it or whatever. So um, I would definitely encourage you all to be a part of our community, get in there with CSX, start going to workshops. If you haven't already, you know, do the free stuff first and get, get in and be a part of part of our community. And then as you're ready to get into the immersive and to apply for it, just keep an eye out for that. They will be first come first serve. So just FYI, it's not on the website yet. You are the first to know it has not been, I mean, it was just approved finally today. So I was like, so excited to be able to share it with y'all. Um, so just FYI, great opportunity. I think I knew that Brandy, that you were a recipient of the last round of this. So awesome, wonderful. Um, so just super excited to be able to share that tonight. Um, okay. So we're going to close out the last, you all have given fabulous advice already. Any final words of advice that you'd like to share with anyone who's thinking about making that move into the tech industry? And I will start on my far left, which is Cam, and go through. So Cam, Brandy, Aaron, Kyle. Uh, yeah, I would just say like bet on yourself for sure. Um, like you can 100% do it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really have any other, any other advice than that. Like there is definitely a place for you in this industry. Um, this is not like crazy uh, hard stuff that like 
only a certain subgroup of people will ever be able to figure out like all it's definitely a ton of like false narratives like everyone in this room 100 percent could be a, in the role that i'm in and be able to understand and contribute effectively so definitely bet on yourself um and yeah just try to take it a day at a time and before you know it you'll you'll be at your first role and you'll be second role etc so yeah good luck yeah, my only advice would be, um, I don't think you should base your learning journey, learning journey, don't think like that determines the type of engineer you're going to be. Because when I was in Cold Smith, it was a struggle. Cam knows Cam was actually my fellow. And at one point, I like almost cried to him. And I was like, I'm going to defer Cam. Like it was just, a, Cold Smith was a hard immersive for me. But I kept learning, I kept growing, and I had more of a growth mindset. And so whether you're at Cold Smith doing a boot camp if you're doing another boot camp, which you shouldn't be doing another boot camp. You should be doing Cold Smith, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> or if you're just self-teaching, my biggest encouragement would just be like you're gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna hit a lot of like blocks. Learning how to code is very challenging, but it's doable. Um, and so the, my biggest thing would just be don't think like Oh, like I'm I'm sucking when it comes to learning, you know, different algorithms. That means I'm going to be a horrible engineer. Like that is not what that means. So just go through the learning pain, the growing pains, uh, continue to get better, continue to partner with like other people and just show yourself some grace. Like it's not the end of the world, you know, keep moving forward. And um, yeah, don't be afraid to also just reach out to me, Cam, Aaron, Kyle, all of us. Uh, Jamaica, just reach out for support. That's really big, like having a support system. So, yeah, my advice is, um, and I guess in the spirit of of, of what Brandon Cam said as well, um, also um, relating to the, the, I guess the last answer I gave, um, just compare yourself to yourself. Um, you shouldn't compare yourself to your peers, um, your mentors, anyone you're looking to be like. Um, compare yourself to how you was yesterday or like five minutes ago when you, you didn't get that problem. Um, and if you, you keep that mindset, you'll, you'll see like you're getting better um, each and every day. And if you focus on that, um, it'll help, you know, block out, out all the noise or, you know, all the stress that you might, you know, have to deal with or think about with the, with the, the whole process, because it is very stressful, like interviewing is stressful. All that stuff is stressful. Even when I was doing it for, for Spotify, I was like, oh man, I gotta do these algos again. Like, what is this? Um, but if you compare yourself to yourself, um, just you know, keeping that that cadence and and trying to improve yourself each day, um, it'll make it much easier for you. Yeah, um, there's not much else I can add. I think everyone kind of covered it. Um, just do it. Um, you know, be consistent um learn something new every day even if it's something small and um i would say also don't forget what your interests are um personally work is a lot easier for me if i'm working somewhere that i'm really interested in the product so um i know that it's really important to get a lot of apps out there but if you can really try to focus on a sort of section of the industry that you're super interested in for me that's like video games creativity film right like things of that nature um, there's a lot out there for those things that you are particularly interested in. And I think like trying to get that way sooner than later is going to be really good for you. Awesome. Excellent feedback. Really, really great or excellent advice. Panelists, thank you again. Really loved having you. Really appreciate your time. Um, everyone who stayed for the whole hour and a half, half hour over. Thank you also for being here with us and, and, and talking with us tonight. Um, reach out if you have any questions, but we're going to close it out. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. And um, we hope to see you in some of our communities soon. Thank you. Good night.